Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us for, on this webinar, um, part three, Power Planning on the Coalition Building Training Series. We're going to go through, um, so I'm going to do a little housekeeping before we get started. We're going to go through this presentation in full and take questions at the end. This is because we are recording this webinar for use by those who could not join us today. Everyone is muted right now with the exception of our speakers. We will unmute folks at the end of the event so that you can ask your questions. If you think of a question or want to make a comment during the presentation, please feel free to do so in the chat box below. I've put a feedback survey in the chat box, so please take a moment to, to fill that out at the end of the survey. Your feedback means a lot to us and we take it very serious. So let's get started. My name is Tempest Tuggle. I am the operations manager here at Uncoke My Campus. Um, so I will be facilitating this training today um, along with my colleague, Samantha Parsons. So I'm going to get into um, our deliverables for today. Um, we will do, together we will do an intro to Uncoke, a recap of yesterday's webinar, Step Into Power With Me, Challenges to Power Building and Power Planning, Developing Community Agreements and Strong Teams, effective meetings. So I'm going to take the time to pass it off to Sam. Thanks, Tempest. Hi, everyone. As Tempest said, my name is Samantha Parsons, and I am the campaigns director with Uncoke. I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, what Uncoke My Campus is and our vision for the future. of the people by protecting higher education from actors whose expressed intent is to place corporate interests over the common good. What this means is that we equip activists on and off campus. So we work with students, faculty, but also we work with community leaders and state-based advocacy staff and national advocacy staff. Um, we equip those activists with resources, skills, and a peer-to-peer -peer support system to take on the Coke network. Oftentimes people do think that we only work with campuses, understandably because of our name on Coke My Campus, but more and more people in the community have reached out to us over the past year in particular, asking to be more involved and to uh, be brought into our campus network or into our network in general. And so we've been doing a lot of intentional work to expand that. Um, and this makes sense for us and we're going to talk about this in a little bit but like we on coke we try to be very intentional about not growing just to grow we want to be intentional about um our growth being in terms of not just expansion but deepening our relationships and our analysis um but this expansion to work more closely with community advocates in different issue areas did make a lot of sense for us um, because it literally is impossible to disconnect the influence Coke is buying on campuses across the country from the consequences that influence that he's buying on campuses across the country, how that's actually manifesting in our communities um, everywhere. We do seek to be anti-oppressive in our approach to organizing and, and achieving this vision, which means we critically examine power imbalances in our organizing. Um, and this includes an analysis of the harms caused by capitalism and white supremacy. We incorporate an analysis of those things in our messaging and our campaign work. And we seek to organize from a place that follows the leadership of the most marginalized and affected communities. Last but not least, in terms of our actual like, organizing model or philosophy, we do use a, a distributed model of organizing. This means we partner with other organizations. So we partner with student groups, local community groups, state-based organizations, even national organizations to deepen their resistance to the Coke network and amplify the work that they're already doing 
as a uh, positive vision for moving our country and our world forward away from the control of corporate influence um, rather than just creating entirely new organizations across the country. Um, if you do want to create a student group that is like Uncoke branded or a community group that's Uncoke branded, we do support that as well. Um, but if you're calling in and you're already a part of an established organization, we still work with organizations like yours. Um, creating a pains into the work that you're already doing. Um, and a lot of this is just really wanting, like from Mon Coke's perspective, wanting to really value and honor the work that a lot of organizations across the country are already doing to uncoat our world um, and bringing those folks into partnership with us. Back to you, Tempest. Tempest, I can't hear you. I don't know if other folks might be having trouble or not. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. So in our second webinar series, um, we discussed the following things into asking people to step into power with us. Um, declaring your leadership. So we developed a leadership stance about how we declare leadership and what is the vision that we are creating. Um, we talked about how to proposition others to step into power with you. So how are we asking people to, how are we investing in other people's leadership? Um, and what does that look like? And we discussed leadership development. So how are we developing leaders and always remembering as organizers to keep that in the forefront um, of leadership development? and what were um, accountability coaching steps that we could take together to make sure that as we develop our leaders, we are remaining accountable and we are also um, giving them the right tools and feedback um, in their leadership roles. All right. Um, can you go back one slide for me, Tempest? Um, so before we dig into a lot of what the like real content of this uh, webinar was intended to be, I want to frame it for a second. Um, so, so far, if you've joined us on the previous webinars on coalition building and power building, um, we've discussed how to tell your story how to use your story and your own self-interest to build relationship with others and steps you can take to grow your organization or coalition in ways that are really rooted in relationship. Um, and today, as Tippis has talked to us about, we are going to talk more about tips for working within those relationships to effectively move our campaigns forward. And this includes things like naming our values, developing community agreements, and running effective meetings. But before we hop into that, I want to speak briefly um, to situate those tips within some of the common challenges I see that uh, move, sometimes move our organizations or our campaigns off track. And many of those challenges can actually be traced back to the practice of white supremacy culture within our organizations. And I will say from a personal perspective, it wasn't until I started understanding um, the ways in which white supremacy culture shows up in our relationships with one another, that I was truly able to be a lot more intentional in not only building those relationships, but also building relationships intended to be deep enough and intentional enough to build a movement and build a campaign. Um, because it's really hard work. <laughs> um, and so if we can unlearn some of these habits, the, um, it will actually help putting our power building into practice and it will help us become a lot more effective and intentional when planning out the steps we want to take to move to build that power. Um, 
I will, I just want to give credit. So I'm bringing a lot, like all of these slides that I'm about to go over. I've taken content from Dismantling Racism, a workbook for social change groups by Kenneth Jones and Tama Okun. Um, and we'll be sure to follow up with y'all after this, as well as host this information on our website, should you want to read the entire uh, handout that, that I pulled a lot of these following slides from. And I actually really encourage folks to do a deep dive into this content. All right, so one of the major characteristics of white supremacy culture that shows up in our organizations is perfectionism. To us as community members viewing mistakes as a personal failure rather than a mistake simply being a mistake. So sometimes when we're building with others or counting on one another, we can fall into a trap of seeing that someone who made a mistake, they themselves are the mistake, rather than a mistake as an action someone makes and that, that can be corrected um, and, and therefore does not require like any type of punitive punishment. Um, there can be like a level of restorative justice there if a mistake is made. Um, because of this emphasis on perfectionism, there's also oftentimes little energy or time put into reflecting um, on ways that you we can improve within our organizations. Um, and we see this show up a lot in terms of like, we work really hard to get events, uh, to put on events or host actions in our organizing. But we don't always take the time to debrief all of that. And if we do take the time to debrief it, sometimes we only talk about like the actual event or the actual action, rather than fully talking about all the steps and debriefing all the steps that it took to, for us to get to that action. And so, um, and this leads to this, like, this understanding that we want to feel perfect. We want to feel like we did everything properly, whereas there's a lot of room to grow and there's a lot of beautiful relationship building that can come out of growth with one another that a lot of us are missing out on because of this, like, habit of perfectionism. Um, I also have seen that this habit of perfectionism results um, into, like, this this fear of making mistakes actually prevents leaders from trusting future leaders or trusting new and fresh ideas. And we think that's really critical to point that out because we're talking here about the importance of leadership development. And I know, like, again, from a personal experience, when I was, like, really invested in a campaign and I really wanted to win, it was really hard to also, like, give up some of my responsibility to someone new but I was doing such a disservice because I was leaning into my perfectionist tendencies, assuming that like, because I had been around for a minute, I could do it better. When in reality, we can do a lot better when we work in partnership and we share roles and share responsibility. Um, and so we really wanted to emphasize this habit of perfectionism, particularly as a barrier to doing the power building and doing the leadership development that's really critical in our movement. Some anecdotes to this is to develop a culture of appreciation. So while it is really important to debrief actions and debrief everything that we do and identify places where we could have perhaps done better, there's also oftentimes a ton of things that people do right. But in those debrief meetings, we only talk about what happened that we want to really win. We can also develop a culture within our organizations and groups to highlight the ways in which mistakes actually do offer opportunities for learning and growth. Like I said, I know that my closest relationships in life and also in work are tied to people that I have made mistakes with um, and people who have like been put the effort forward to hold me accountable. But because of that, I was able to grow and that relationship was able to deepen through that growth as well. And so resisting this tendency of perfectionism can not only help us be better leaders, but it can also help deepen those relationships that we've been talking about um, that are so critical to our work. Next slide, please. Another habit of white supremacy culture that has, that can pop up to hinder our power building is this sense of urgency. I know that I'm sure the most of the people that are on this webinar who will be watching this webinar at another point are doing really critical community or campus-based work 
um, and are doing that work because someone is being harmed, you see that harm is an injustice and you want to fix it. That is the community that we all exist in together and that's a beautiful community, community to be a part of. Um, but that can also put a ton of pressure on us to want to move in a direction that's super fast paced and every decision we make comes out of this place of an, like an urgency that we can't avoid. Um, but in reality, like building a sustainable movement requires us to not only want to move forward and achieve campaign goals, but also move forward and like actually invest in human beings and invest in relationships that are going to be required to move that campaign forward. Um, and so when you allow the sense of urgency to really affect your campaign work, it can be really harmful because you're not taking the time to be inclusive in your decision making. Um, and you're not necessarily always thinking long term. I know that um, in a lot of the campaigns that I've found successful have been the ones where despite feeling very overwhelmed, I did take time to work with my team and map out a plan for the future months in advance. And of course those plans are going to pivot and change and those moments suck um, because we invested so much time in um, planning them. But just sitting down and making those intentional plans also open really necessary, much like very necessary space to be thoughtful and inclusive in our decision making. The sense of urgency also can result in us sacrificing really important allies for quick or highly visible results. And oftentimes we see this play out most predominantly in white led receiving but are not actual and that are like doing democracy work um but they're not actually talking or connected to the or, like the people who are being affected by the harms that that organization's trying to correct um and because they need you know organizations need to like prove that they can do something and to prove that they have results they have the sense of urgency to prove themselves and that results and oftentimes sacrificing the people at the table who should be actually leading the conversation at the table. Um, some anecdotes, anecdotes for that is creating realistic work plans, being really mindful and intentional about long-term planning, um, acknowledging that sometimes tasks do take longer than expected, and that's just the reality of the work. Again, it's not a mistake of an individual. Um, and then setting goals for what it means to be inclusive and actually developing out work plans related to those processes instead of just developing out work plans for the creation of content or the creation or like the, the planning of an action. You're also developing a work plan that's intentionally about the process in which you want to use to move your campaign forward and being intentional about that process being very focused on um, being inclusive. Another common habit is the focus of quantity over quality. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but a lot of this results in um, our organizations being much more focused on turnout than leadership development. And a lot of this, I want to admit and acknowledge that this is a lot oftentimes driven by the nonprofit industrial complex where donors are very mis disconnected from our organizations and they want to fund, you know, events and actions that turn out thousands of people instead of thinking about how critical it is to maybe turn out 100 people. But if you have time to follow up with 50 of those and turn them into leaders, that's actually a much more sustainable and impressive movement than turning out thousands of people to an event. Um, and so when working with students, I really try to emphasize this as well. I, I love fun actions and I love major events and they can be really critical for political education and meeting new people, but the time should really be invested in once you get those people to somewhere, um, making sure you build in time into your work plan or into your campaign plan that you're going to have the capacity to follow up with the majority of those folks who showed up to see if they want to become more involved because that's the crux of your leadership development. Um, and I, I kind of feel like I went over the anecdotes to that. So for the sake of time, I'll move on.
obviously this does show up in our organizations. I also feel that it shows up in our opposition and I like to emphasize that um, when talking about particularly campus movements, but also community-based movements as well. So with paternalism, this habit often manifests in ways where people who have power think that they're capable of making decisions for those who don't have power. People who have power um, don't think it's important or necessary to understand the viewpoint or experiences um, of those for whom they're making decisions. And those without power do not know how decisions get made and are oftentimes the ones who are most affected by the decisions that are getting made. Um, like I said, this shows up in our organizations, particularly when student organizations are white led. Um, and it shows up in our opposition. I've seen one of the major ways that student organizing is pushed back um, against by administrators or even like community based organizing is pushed back against by local representatives or state representatives is when these people take a very paternal approach to organizers themselves saying, you know, we need, we need statistics, we need data instead of storytelling. Um, being paternal in the sense of denying people's emotions and lived experiences. Um, you'll always hear staff at Uncope talk about how we prioritize storytelling oftentimes over, um, or we at least view it as just as critical as data and statistics because people's real life impact or what should be driving um, policy change. And, and, but oftentimes you'll have administrators or representatives who are in power that we're trying to appeal to, who very much put that burden back on organizers and say, you know, you're just too emotional or I need to see the data. I oftentimes or almost all the time tell student activists to resist the urge to fall into that trap. It is paternalistic. Um, and the reality is that a lot of like these people work for us um, and it's up to them to define some policies that, you know, could be passed or processes that we might need to follow, but they need to develop those based on the stories that we're bringing and the lived experiences people are bringing to the table, um, rather than denying or totally uh, discounting someone's lived experience just because maybe it's an emotional story. Um, and then this is also important in terms of leadership development. It's really hard for someone new to come into your organization and take on a, a, a strong role within the organization if they don't know how decisions are made or if they're not included in the decision making process. And so really working to ensure that not only our events and our like recruitment is inclusive and the way in which we build our the way it also has to be inclusive otherwise we're not actually bringing new members fully into the fold of our organizations and then the last thing i will emphasize is power hoarding and gatekeeping is a huge barrier to leadership development power building and relationships um, when i talk about power hoarding and gate gatekeeping i'm talking about the fact that there's little value around sharing power or decision making. Power is seen as something that's limited or scarce. And so there's no such thing as sharing power. Someone has to have the ultimate final say. Um, those with power feel threatened when anyone suggests changes and how things should be done, which is a huge barrier to someone who's new and might have a fresh perspective. Um, those of us who do a lot of this work full time or have been if you're a student and you're a, you know, a junior or a senior and you've been working on a campaign for the past two to three years, having a fresh perspective can be really, really critical to actually freshening up your tactics or maybe even changing your messaging because something hasn't been working for the past two to three years. But if we keep leaning into this concept of power hoarding, then we could really um, fail to create space for new people to bring those suggestions to us. Those with power oftentimes don't see themselves as hoarding power. Um, and this is oftentimes tied to just like a misunderstanding of what leadership truly is, which if you go back and listen to the, the, the content that Tempest outlined in the first two webinars of the series, I think we can unpack that um, and really get a clearer sense of what leadership looks like. 
and then those with power assuming they have the best interests of the organization at heart. Here, it's really important to be mindful of intent versus impact. People might have the best intentions and feel that they have the best interests of the organization at heart, but making executive decisions without collective buy-in or support um, from the rest of your team is still a form of power hoarding. Um, and on that note, I also really want to highlight a, a, a challenge that I've seen a lot of organizations and our more progressive spaces face is this emphasis on horizontal leadership. Horizontal leadership is a beautiful thing because it helps us resist the, the concept of hierarchy and people being more important than the other. But I've seen horizontal leadership go in a direction where something as simple as sending a tweet or crafting a Facebook event requires the buy-in and approval of every team member. Um, like I've literally witnessed that happen and I've witnessed that really slow the progress of organizations down in terms of achieving their um, campaign goals. And so there's a difference between slowing down and being intentional in order to uh, push back on the sense of urgency to be more down um, and pausing the work uh, simply because you don't want to give up power. Um, oftentimes what I encourage, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about team building, is that you can have horizontal leadership where you still equip people within your organization to be the bottom liners of certain tasks. And so the organization as a whole, horizontally, can equip certain point people on that team to be in control of social media. And that means as long as that person, those people who've been equipped to be in control of social media are informed of the organization's values and community agreements, which we're gonna talk about soon, then they shouldn't have to come to the rest of the team to get approval on a Facebook post or a tweet. Um, and I've seen that this is not only much more efficient in getting work done, but it ultimately does provide really valuable space for, for new members to feel like they have some sort of control um, or power that's been invested or vested upon them by their team. And this also goes back to resisting perfectionism. You might, you know, equip someone with a bottom lining role to work on a very specific task. And if they make a mistake, they make a mistake. That isn't because you shouldn't give them that role. It's because every single human makes mistakes. And that's a reality of all organizing. And like, just that's a reality of being a, a human being. Um, and, can, and shouldn't be used as an excuse to gatekeep resources. So yeah, I will pass it back off to Tempest, but I just, I felt that it was kind of critical to talk about some of these challenges because unlearn, unlearning a lot of those habits or developing your community agreements um, and your team model in a way that resists those habits can really set you up to be successful in your power planning and power building moving forward. Thank you so much. Um, so let's talk a little bit about community agreements, um, com what they are and like how they help build our movement. So community agreements are just a measurement of accountability, transparency among coalitions, community partnerships, and organizations. Um, and so they just help reinforce inclusiveness among group diversity. So um, make it, so like we talked about, Sam just talked about, did a really good job about talking about the different types of leadership um, and making sure that we are honoring like the differences among people. Um, it also strengthens the group's clarity around strategies, communication, and accountability. So how are we being clear about um, the vision and what, how are we shaping um, the movement that we are building? Um, the support of other issues outside of our coalition and organization. Sometimes um, it helps us create balance, like what are the measurements we will take to look at issues that are not particularly just our own, but issues of um, people that are also a part of our community. 
and also gives guidelines to like how a meeting can function. Um, if you've ever been to a meeting, you know, they can sometimes be haywire if they do not have a set of guidelines. Um, people can leave feeling really um, angry, hurt, unheard, um, or like they're not really a part of a movement. So it is best for people to come together in the beginning to begin to develop community agreements to set a healthy work atmosphere. Um, it's helpful. <laughs> They're not set in stone um, because they can always evolve, right? So things are always changing. Um, sometimes we just need to get some boundaries established um, and as our thinking evolves as we undo some of the isms that Sam mentioned today um, we think about other things that we can actually add on to the plan um, so agreements that we could possibly make um, when we are a community with other people um, is encouraging people to step up and step back Sometimes people show up to meetings um, and they don't say anything at all. And so we wanna encourage those people to step up and speak and give their input if they have any. Um, and sometimes we need to encourage people to step back for a second um, in our meetings um, because they may take up the whole meeting um, and monopolize the situation. Um, also challenging the isms. Um, so I use community agreements all the time. That is like the first part of my agenda when I am hosting a meeting. And the reason is because I want us to always come together and understand how are we working together and how are we going to be in community with each other. And so challenging the isms for me is really big. So how are we challenging perfectionism and allowing people um, to create? Um, and also like how are we challenging perfectionism in the form of appreciations, appreci appreciating um, the ones that we are in community with. Um, a community agreements really need to be inclusive and free of recreating the systemic oppression um, that is already happening. Um, a lot of the time, because we are acting in the sense of urgency, we don't really understand um, how we are recreating that systemic oppression. And so when we create these community agreements, it helps us embody um, dismantling those behaviors. Excuse me. So let's talk about uh, some team models. So one of the team, so let's talk about an ineffective team model, actually. So one where everyone leads. So everyone gets um, a piece of a piece of the work and they just go in their own directions and it's kind of like okay well when we come back together we might be able to actually do some work but we're not sure because there is no clear communication about what's really happening there we just know everybody has a task and it may or may not be getting done um, and but nobody's checking in um soul leadership um, when one person has all of the leadership, when everything is always directed to that person um, and they're not passing on the work, they're hoarding the work um, and people are laying everything on them, that is also very ineffective. Um, yesterday we talked about how we can sustain our movement. This is definitely not how we sustain our movement um, by focusing on soul leadership. This does create that kind of burnout that we talked about yesterday. Um, and then the other ineffective leadership is who's leading. So, you know, people are just doing whatever and you're not really sure who's running the social media. You're not really sure who's doing um, the planning for the next event. You're not sure if the turnout has been done. And so that is also ineffective and non-sustainable. So none of these models are sustainable models for our organizations um, or our teams, just because they create um, dysfunction, they create um, a lot of ways that 
when we talked about yesterday, it doesn't develop leadership. Um, I, in the way we think about leadership models, they should always be leadership developing. So one of my favorite effective team models, um, it is actually, um, the, they call it the snowflake model. I just call it an everybody leads model. Um, so in the center, you have your core leadership, which may or may not be comprised of one to two committee leaders um, who come and speak on behalf of the committee. And so um, this helps, this model, I like it because it helps create that balance in leadership styles because everything everybody leads pretty differently. Um, so it doesn't allow for one person to just be the leader. It allows for multiple people to be the leader and it creates um, clear defined roles for people. Um, so people can be in these committees um, in a social media committee and understand the roles that they need to fill there. Some people can be in the trainings committee and understand the role that they need to fill there. Um, so it creates um, a level of practices for leadership development. Um, and it also reflects um, decisions of the group. Um, the group is able to make healthy linear decisions um, just based on how they set up um, the committees, right? So there's not one person making all the decisions. This is a group of people who are leading these decisions together instead of it being all over the place, like we talked about in the ineffective models, um, just one person who owns all that leadership and making all these decisions um, that may be very ineffective. Um, so this creates balance. Um, and we have to remember that we just need a little balance in our organizations. And the more that we are working on how do we develop leaders in a form um, of effective team models, it will create a lot of balance for our, our organizations and teams so that we are able to have um, long lasting, healthy, sustaining, um, movements. So I'm going to move on to effective meetings. Um, so a lot of our meetings that we go to sometimes can be really boring, they can lack direction, um, but meetings can be a really informative way um, to develop our strategy and an opportunity to de develop more skills. So if our meetings aren't playing with the shared goal in mind, sometimes they can be hard to manage um, if the right mechanisms aren't in place. Um, Sometimes uh, when the things are not in place, like community agreements, um, challenging in the isms, and also us personally working on how do we dismantle those um, habits of white supremacy, um, it can be hard to sit in a meeting. Um, I've seen meetings where people have blown up um, and it was dangerous. Um, I've seen meetings where um, people could not recenter themselves um, or there was nothing accomplished because no one could stay on task or people didn't even know why we were meeting. And so we want to avoid that um, by creating an agenda that outlines why are we meeting in the first place um, and what are the goals we are trying to accomplish. Um, just the purpose of why are we here? Because um, sometimes we get into elongated purposes and we they don't have to be, you know, six pages long. It can be a simple check-in is why we're here. Um, it could be a simple opportunity to develop a strategy. Um, so why are we here when we are um, thinking about our meetings? Um, we want to start a meeting with a check-in, reflection, or ancestral acknowledgments. 
So um, at the top of my meetings, I like to always start in with a check-in. The reason why I start with a check-in is because I want to see the kind of energy people are bringing into the room. Um, sometimes um, we take for granted that just because we're doing this work that we're okay. And sometimes it's okay to not be okay and to need space to want to leave or to just say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with and I just want to let you know. Um, reflections can also be good. So reflecting on, you know, words of our ancestors, um, and especially ancestral acknowledgement, um, honoring the land, the sacred land that we sit on, um, because a lot of the land that is here is not ours and it does not belong to us. And so how are we um, starting our meeting with honoring those around us? Um, and in our meetings with evaluations um, to strengthen our meetings going forward. So like what happened in this meeting? What are not necessarily negatives? We call them deltas. What are things we can change? Um, and what are things that are doing really great um, that we need to keep the same? I also like to take that time to end meetings with appreciations. Um, as um, Sam's talked about in perfectionism, um, we sometimes often overlook people. And so I really love appreciations at the end of my meeting just to say, hey, like I appreciate you for maybe giving me um, a new outlook on an issue that I haven't seen yet. Um, and so just a one sentence about like how you appreciate someone um, can always make a difference. Um, and as we've been talking about, it is important to think about leadership development. So um, this is an opportunity for you to recruit the facilitators, note takers, and timekeepers, um, because we should not be doing that all by ourselves. Um, that should not be one person. Um, and also create space for an agenda change at the beginning of each meeting. This will allow for us to pivot if we need to right um like right now it's happening in the world i don't think we thought we would all be quarantined in a house or wherever we are in our places to feel safe and so how are we cre pivoting um to create a more accessible learning opportunities for people right or how are we creating how are we pivoting to shift um our commit to support our communities during this time. So we have to always make sure that we are creating space for things to change because everything is not set in stone. So making an agenda. Um, this sometimes seems simple, but sometimes we make it very um, difficult to actually make an agenda. agenda. Um, but they don't have to be, right? So writing it out really helps you set the vision for why you are meeting. Um, some Mostly a meeting with no purpose is oftentimes ineffective um, because you feel like you are wasting time. So if you don't need to have a check-in with people because you just checked in with everybody yesterday, then you might not need to actually have a meeting. So. Um, sometimes writing out, like maybe you want to write it out in your tablet, in your notebook, but just getting it out of like, why are we having this meeting um, is definitely important. Um, agendas help our meetings by giving us guidance to the strategy um, while we're preparing for events and helps us stay focused on the mission. Um, if we don't if we're not staying focused on the mission that is at hand, um, then the problem is we begin to derail and we begin to organize in a mess. It becomes chaotic and there is no clear direction and it provides bad development of, leaders, of leaders in our uh, community. It also creates transparency among the group. Um, I personally have been to meetings where people have um, a monopolized agenda, and so we didn't know what was on it until we got there. We weren't able to change it, and 
it actually didn't meet the need. Um, so people left, right? So we want to make sure that people are very clear about what they are showing up to and that this is not a trick so that someone can monopolize um, our time together. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Also honoring the community agreements that we all set together. Like if we're going to be in community with each other, I think that it is also important to use that time in the agenda to just go back over what are the agreements. So when I start a meeting, um, the three things that are always in my meeting is the check-in of like, how are you doing? Um, and it also is the second, the community agreements because we said we're gonna be in community with each other. Um, and so how are we going to maintain this? And this is the thing that we want to manifest while we are meeting with each other. And then it also allows for opportunities of leadership development. So like I said earlier, you can recruit people to do note taking, um, and it's also an opportunity to say, hey, you know, we talked about all this work, now we need people to sign up. So then this is your opportunity to invite people in to leadership to actually do the work that you all are naming in those meetings. So one of my favorite um, quotes is by Florence Kennedy, who is a Black woman civil rights activist. Uh, and she said, don't agonize, organize. Um, a lot of the time, um, we are complaining about how we don't get the work done or um, sometimes we are frustrated and feeling just lost. And so I hope that, you know, you're using this to, these tools to not um, agonize, but how can you organize a better team and better strategy and create a better vision? So I want to give you um, an example of a POP agenda. Um, I use a POP agenda when I am making everything. Um, I made a POP agenda when I made this training. Um, the POP agenda is three steps, um, purpose, outcomes, and process. Um, so the purpose is usually one to two sentences that talks about what is your goal. And then the outcomes um, is usually maybe two to four sentences that just says, um, how, what are the outcomes you need to see to get to that goal? And then the third part of that is the process. Um, so how will you go about maintain, getting to these deliverables uh, to achieve your goal? And so sometimes that looks like um, the agenda or the tactics or strategies that you need to win your issue. So um, my purpose was to develop training tools for activists, organizers, and other community leaders to utilize in their organizing. Um, my outcomes for these people were to gain the following skills of political education, team building, and leadership development. Um, the agenda that I used was a check-in, community agreement. We did wonderful political education, and then we had a meeting evaluation. Um, so this is how I kind of like make my agendas. Um, so I know why I'm meeting because I want to make sure that I'm developing um, training tools for community leaders um, to utilize in their organizing. And then the things that I want them to get out of this meeting to make sure that goal is met is a little political education, some team building exercises, um, and maybe some, and some leadership development. And so this is how I see doing that in my agenda. So um, I just wanna take the time to pass it back to Sam. Hey y'all. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Tempest. That was very, very helpful. Um, right now we'll go over some next steps and then we can dive into some questions. So in terms of next steps, I do recommend folks watch webinars one and two. 
because a lot of the concepts around leadership development um, that were that need to be done in order to get us to this place of, of running effective meetings or even like it all it all works interchangeably right like running an effective meeting having strong community agreements having agendas can set us up well to do solid leadership development and at the same time to newcomers it, i mean to be blunt it looks like we have our shit together and so they want to stay a part of our organization and a part of our groups and so all of this goes hand in hand, so please take a look at those webinars if you haven't already. Um, as a follow-up email, I will be sending out the entire Characteristics of White Supremacy Culture resource that I pulled those slides from, and I encourage folks to read that. Um, and then, because so much of our team model and our leadership development um, and unlearning those habits of white supremacy culture um, can be done if we, and be done a lot easier if we have organizational value statements and community agreements. I really encourage um, folks to like, if you already don't have a value statement or community agreements within your student org or state-based org or community org to, to create them. And it can be a really fun relationship building opportunity in and of itself to create them together. And then I definitely encourage you to review your team model and leadership development model for ways you might be able to pivot away from some of those white supremacy culture um, habits. Um, and kind of as, as a direct pivot, uh, David asked about resources for delegating tasks in a horizontal way that doesn't perpetuate perfectionism. Um, really, I mean, this can be done fairly easy based on your organization's needs and roles that you need developed. Um, what I suggest first and foremost is that creating or de defining your values and your community agreements. From there, you can identify people who want or, you know, they're not super excited or willing to take on certain tasks, because let's be real, not all of us, even if we have our dream job, we don't like all the tasks we have to do, right? Um, and again, the, like, Developing people who are willing to take on those tasks can be done through the concepts of leadership development that Tim has shared with us on the earlier webinars. Once that person expresses interest or expresses a commitment to carry out those tasks, get the group to express some form of some form of affirmation and buy-in on them executing those tasks. It can literally be as simple as like you're sitting in your student group weekly meeting and you're going over the agenda and you see that you really need someone to start taking on social media um, or you need someone to uh, be in charge of a recruitment plan for the next month and someone can you know express interest in doing those things and then in the, the rest of the room can nod their heads and express a affirmation of that person taking those roles on um, or if they have concerns, that's a space where those people can raise those concerns. And that's a, a very easy way of effectively having a horizontal conversation where everyone in the space has the opportunity to either express affirmation for that person taking on that role or express concerns and encourage the team to work through those concerns. Once that happens, um, you know, it could be like, well, so now David is going to bottom line social media for the next month or David is going to bottom line these three tasks and so the team then equips David with that collective buy-in for David to run with it um, and, and fulfill those tasks in the way that David feels is the best way to fulfill those tasks. What's also really nice is that if you have those values and community agreements defined the person who is equipped with that role can refer back to the, those agreements and those values to guide them in the production of that content or the completion of those tasks. Um, and should the person who is equipped with that role um, make a mistake or maybe be, maybe be late in you know, completing the tasks, the team can also refer back to the values and community agreements to guide their reaction. So just like if we were working on social media posts and we, you know, the team empowered or equipped one person with the ability to be their social media, the person bottom line social media, and you have clearly stated in your back, are in your engagement, then you probably 
that person who's doing social media knows they probably should not or definitely should not be racist or sexist or share racist or sexist content on social media. If your values are, you know, rooted in resisting capitalism or white supremacy, it then equips that social media person with the confidence to include an analysis or commentary about capitalism or white supremacy in their social media posts. And then let's say someone messes up or makes a small mistake. If the team's values say, well, we want to resist perfectionism, that means the team can then go to that person who is equipped with that role and say, you know, first of all, you only messed up once. And so you spent a whole month doing amazing work and we affirm that work you did. There was this moment where we felt you slipped up and this is how we would love to see it pivoted moving forward and that be that. Um, or if you did cause some more extreme harm for some reason, the community, if your values are rooted in um, slowing down and not leaning into a sense of urgency, maybe your organization might push back a big event or something because you need to prioritize repairing that harm.